Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole. And on today's episode, we're talking about interoception, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's actually really critical to our functioning and overall wellness. It's basically the ability to be aware of and respond to internal sensations or information in the body. So we're talking about things like hunger, fatigue, feeling hot or cold, needing to use the bathroom, those types of things. You can imagine the kinds of challenges that come up when a child or an adult is struggling with this sense. And that's exactly what happens for many kids and adults who have things like autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, sensory processing, anxiety, and lots of other neurodevelopmental or mental health challenges. This is an issue that I don't think is understood or appreciated nearly enough, especially when we're looking at underlying causes of behavior and other kinds of challenges for kids. So I'm excited to have Dr. Kelly Mahler with us today to help us understand more about it. Let me tell you a bit about her. She has a doctorate in occupational therapy and has been an occupational therapist for 18 years, serving school-age children and adults. Kelly's the winner of multiple awards, including the 2020 American Occupational Therapy Association Emerging and Innovative Practice Award and a Mom's Choice Gold Medal. She's an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Occupational Therapy at Elizabethtown College and is actively involved in several research projects pertaining to topics like interoception, self-regulation, trauma, and autism. Kelly's an international speaker and presents frequently on topics related to a wide variety of resources she has authored. She's got lots of great books and resources like the Interoception Curriculum, Interoception Activity Cards, Sensory Issues and High Functioning Autism, lots of amazing things that Kelly has done, and we'll make sure that she tells us more about that. But let's dive in, and Kelly, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dr. Nicole, for having me. I'm so excited to be here and talk about Interoception. This is, as I said, something that I don't think is talked about enough. Usually when I use this word, parents look at me like, okay, I've heard a lot of strange words in my journey of having my kid evaluated and treated, but what is this that you speak of? And yet it's something that's so key to like every aspect of our functioning and being um, in the world. So I'm excited that you have sort of specialized in this with what you do. Um, and I think it's gonna really lead to a lot of ahas for our listeners today. Um, I think let's dive right in. Let's start with really laying a foundation for people of what is interoception. When we say this, what are we really talking about? Yeah, you did a really great job of defining it, but what we know about interoception, it, it is a sensory system, just like vision or hearing. Um, and instead of pulling in information from the world outside of our bodies, interoception's job is to pull information from the inside of our bodies. So you have receptors for interoception located extensively throughout the inside of your body. So like in your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your bladder, your colon, your skin, your muscles, even like the lining of your mouth, the whites of your eyeballs, and these little receptors for interoception are pulling in information about how all of these different body parts are feeling. Um, so like the receptors in the lining of your stomach, pulling in information about how is your stomach feeling? Like, is it empty? And has that growly feeling? feeling or is it full? Is it nauseous? Is it gassy? Uh, do you have that like tingly butterfly feeling in there? So uh, many of us feel these sensations from the inside of our bodies because of the sense called interoception. And like you said, um, interoception has such a wide influence on all of our lives. So it's really important to know about. I wish it was given a different name because it's not a very like sexy, yeah. you know, word, right? Like no one wants to know what interoception is, but right. once you learn about it, it like makes, it gives everyone, including myself, aha moments. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it relates to so many aspects of our lives. Absolutely. And I think it's sort of like proprioception, vestibule, like we, all these words, it's like, oh, could we come up with like more just, I don't know, tangible or less, um, sort of, scary or big sounding words for these things. You know, it's interesting because we teach kids from an early age, like part of the preschool and kindergarten curriculum is our five senses, mm -hmm. right? And, and as most parents know who are listening, if you've been in the realm of, um, you know, sensory uh, processing or integration work, or you've got a kid with, you know, some challenges, you've probably been exposed to things like the proprioceptive sense, the vestibular sense, you know, where are we in space, those types of things. 
But what we're talking about here with interoception is, is an eighth sense, is even another one to add to it. And it's so interesting because our senses are just not limited to those five that we learn about. No, yes. And thankfully, there is a lot more um, knowledge spreading about the lesser known senses, like you you mentioned, like our vestibular and proprioceptive sense, but um, interoception is definitely lagging and um, it is the newest um, sense to be discovered and studied. I mean, it's been defined since for over a hundred years, yeah. um, but people just didn't realize how important it was mm -hmm. until uh, the last 20 years. And yeah. now there's thousands of research studies. I mean, neuroscientists are scrambling to learn more about interoception. The National Institute of Health in our country, in the US has um, devoted millions and millions and millions of dollars to research um, just this year in figuring out interoception because um, what research is revealing is that interoception underlies a lot of areas, but, but most importantly, our mental health, mm -hmm. um, because you have to be clearly aware of how your body is feeling. Um, those body signals um, provide us really important clues to our emotional experience. So if you really think about like, how do you know when you're hungry? Many of us, it's based on the way our body feels like maybe, and it's different for all of us. But for me, I notice like a growling feeling in my stomach and I feel like sluggish and I know like I'm hungry, I need to eat. Or you know, I know that I'm anxious based on the way my body feels, the interceptive signals coming from my body. Like I get super tense in my neck muscles mm -hmm. and I have a tight feeling in my chest. And those interceptive signals are providing me with clues like something's off, you know, in my body, I'm feeling anxious and I need to do something to take care of my body and my and my mental well-being. Um, so interception uh, is, you know, is very, very important, especially to our mental well-being. Well, and I want to dive into the ways that we can see problems with this show up. But what I hear, you know, you saying is that really um, this is about that awareness of those internal signals, which we know some kids, some adults seem to really lack connectivity to that sense, right? Like they're not picking up on those cues. They're not aware of them. So um, or it takes a lot of intensity for them to become aware of those sensations. And then would it be fair to say, because as you're talking about the mental health piece, particularly as it relates to anxiety, there can be people on the other end of that spectrum who sort of are hyper aware, overly aware, constantly aware of and analyzing every little interoceptive twinge signal. And that can, you know, exacerbate anxiety. So just like any other sense that we might be dealing with, it sounds like we've got this spectrum of responses from under responsive to super over responsive. Is that, does that sound right? Yes, you're absolutely correct. And within the general population, we all have varying degrees of how aware we are of certain sensations. And some days we might be more in tune with our bodies other days we might not be and so that fluctuation is very is very typical but there are people that live more at the at the extreme ends of that awareness level like you say and like some people tend to be more um overly aware of their internal sensations so they um are feeling so many different things happening on the inside of their body at once like i i worked with a client that every time he ate he could feel his meal digesting mm -hmm. through his body so imagine trying to like if you're a child a student in school and you're eating lunch and then expected to go to math class and pay attention but all you feel is that digestive process in your body i mean that is highly highly distracting mm -hmm. um or you know when we talk about pain pain is an interoceptive mm -hmm. function we feel pain because of interest reception and for a lot of people they can over they can be overly responsive to pain sensations so they might have chronic pain or they may be the child that's constantly running to the nurse's office or complaining of a lot of different um symptoms in their body but it's, it is a real experience it's not them being um, overly dramatic, or sometimes these people get labeled as attention seeking, which I right. really don't like that term, but yeah. uh, it is a real sensory experience right. for them. They are overly feeling. And then we have people that we know are on the other end of that where they're under responsive and they might completely miss important clues coming from their body. Like they might not ever notice that growling stomach cueing them in that they're hungry and they're relying on people in their life to remind them to eat, mm -hmm. or they might not notice the feelings of thirst or needing the bathroom. Yep. And so they're relying on other people to help them 
to ensure that they're drinking or getting to the bathroom in a timely fashion. Or like you said, for these individuals, um, sometimes they do pick up on body signals, but only the really intense ones. So these are the kids that don't notice they're in a meltdown or approaching meltdown yeah. until they are in the height of it, yeah. right? And these kids, these kids are, they're, they're labeled as like they, their emotions go from zero to 100 in a mm -hmm. seeming blink of an eye. But really what's happening a lot of times is that there are some subtle inner sensations, but they're missing those clues mm -hmm. saying like some of us, like we have these subtle signals saying, hmm, something's feeling off in my body and our bodies are designed to be uncomfortable. Like that discomfort gives us a lot of important information. Like, hmm, something's going on. Like I should do something to help my body feel a little bit more comfortable. But for these individuals, they miss those subtle sensations. And then they're like, bam, you know, they're in shutdown or they're in meltdown. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, it's too late to mm -hmm. have any rational thought, right? Like you need someone in your life to step in and help you co-regulate, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting because we tend to look at, as we do with all behaviors, but particularly as we're thinking about this, you know, these interoceptive kinds of signals, we look at it through the lens of our experience. And if you're a parent or a teacher or a therapist or a whoever with an intact, well-honed, well-regulated interoceptive system, we just automatically assume that the child or the person we're dealing with, it's the same thing for them. And so this idea that they may not even be registering or recognizing these internal sensations it doesn't even occur to us because we just take it for granted that that happens and yet there's so many places where this plays a role and shows up in creating some real problems you just mentioned one of them being in you know regulating your emotional and behavioral states right recognizing the 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 mounting signals the mounting stress so that you can do something before you hit that meltdown point I'm thinking too about, you know, toileting and toilet training, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so often parents will come in, you know, to the clinic, whether they have a neurotypical kid who's just really struggling to toilet train or it's come and they'll say they don't, you know, it, it, they wait until they're absolutely going to have an emergency and wet their pants before, mm -hmm. you know, you ask them 10 minutes before, do you have to go to the bathroom? No, I don't. But then we leave the house and now it's like an emergency and they're flooding everywhere. It's like, right, they're not cued into those signals. And I think a lot of people start developmentally before their kid is ready, whether their child is neurotypical or has you know, a neurodevelopmental issue. If they're not registering those signals, they're not going to truly be able to independently you know, use the bathroom appropriately because they truly aren't picking up on those signals, right? So that's another area where this really plays a functional role. Absolutely, yes. And a lot of our toileting programs are behavior-based or yes. it, modes of external mm -hmm. you know, methods of teaching toileting when actually one of the biggest components of toileting is that internal experience mm -hmm. and noticing that feeling. That is what motivates all of us to mm -hmm. get to the bathroom, right? And so, yes, kids need to be, um, have that interceptive foundation to be successful in toileting. And of course, there's a lot of other factors, but interception yeah. is, is yeah. a huge missing piece mm -hmm. in most of our toileting approaches. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned a great example, like with, um, how it plays a role in attention. Like if somebody is absorbed with the feelings of what's going on in their body, difficult to attend, what are some other areas that you see? Cause I want to really help listeners to connect this to maybe some things that they're seeing, you know, mm -hmm. with their child, what are some other areas where interoceptive differences or challenges show up um, or, or play a role in the kinds of issues that kids are having? Yeah, so um, some things that come to mind is toileting is a number one um, thing that we hear a lot. Um, needing to be reminded to eat, to drink, um, those are some big signs, um, body temperature. So not being really aware of if you're getting overheated or you're mm -hmm. cold. And we see a lot of kids mismatch, like they insist on not wearing a winter jacket, even right. though it's like really cold outside, right? Um, so they're not really picking up on the way their body feels um, when they're hot or cold. Um, and one of the biggest areas that we get most of our referrals for is um, quote unquote, what some people term challenging behaviors um, and just being able to regulate your, your emotions such as frustration and anxiety. Um, 
um, for a lot of these kids and our approach is we're going to teach you all the coping skills you need. But what one of the biggest signs um, that a lot of our kids, they can memorize coping skills, but they can't use them in the moment. And it's not that they're being oppositional or refusing to do what you're teaching. It's because they don't have those clues coming from their bodies saying something's off. Now's a good time for me to use a coping strategy, right? So that's one of the biggest signs is we hear so many times that a lot of these kids and adults, they can memorize all of these um, strategies and emotion regulation programs, and they can't put it into place um, in the moment. And it's because many times because of this interceptive piece. So we really need to like rewind some of what we're doing and set that foundation. That interception piece is the foundation of emotion regulation. You need to be clearly aware of how you are feeling in order to manage it effectively. Mm. Um, you know, we throw around all these emotion words at these ki at these kids and adults. Yeah. And if you really take a step back and ask them, like, what does frustrated mean to you or what does you know sad mean to you many times they are memorizing these words and they don't really have a concrete understanding of what these things mean because interoception gives us concrete meaning behind each of our emotions mm. um so we throw these things out like when you're frustrated take three deep breaths you know they 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 don't concretely understand what frustrated means to them so it, it, interception is really shedding a light on how we can better support the um, emotion regulation needs in many different aged um, people. It's so interesting because really the thing that got me interested in this and looking into this years and years ago, I had a young adult patient um, diagnosed on the autism spectrum, but um, you know, what, yeah, I, I don't like terms, high functioning and low functioning, but cognitively very intact, had, you know, good insight, was taking steps to move forward in her life. But she said to me one day, she's like, I don't have any sense of what it feels like to feel joy or happiness. And it was interesting. And because she had good insight, it had really been pondering this. We had such a good conversation about it. And I started connecting it to other things with her too, like, body temperature kinds of things like her getting so upset with herself because even as an adult who was trying really hard to use the strategy she had learned, she would find herself in a very over, what she would call overreactive behavior mode to little things. And I started connecting those pieces and it's really what got me interested in this because I thought, oh, all these things go together. These higher level things that she's talking about with, I don't even know what it means to say that I'm joyful about something, um, yeah. that's connected to the same type of thing that's making it difficult for her to regulate her behavior in situations, for her to um, you know, regulate what's going on temperature-wise and activity-wise. Um, and, and so that really, her ability to put some of that into words helped me then get a much better perspective on what's going on for so many of the kids and people that we work with who, who aren't aware of that, who can't put that into words. And so I love that you brought up the emotions piece because I think that's so true. And again, it's like we start from an assumption that this foundation is there, that kids, that people, of course you understand what that feels like. And it's like, no, they, they absolutely may not have any sense of that. And then they're just memorizing and going through the steps. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I have to be the first to admit, like I was one of those people, like I, until learning about interoception, I did assume that um, most people had, you know, most people understood their emotions and they just had a hard time managing them. And interoception has definitely helped me to support my clients in a, in a much more effective and uh, kind way because it's helping me to understand their perspective instead of me infusing my in, in my view of the world on how you should regulate your emotions like our interception work is all about nurturing their curiosity and learning about their own unique interceptive experience um, because I, that's what I really love about interception is that each one of us has a unique inner experience you know like what you feel like when you're anxious is different than me and so it's not about teaching someone this blanket approach of this is anxiety your heart races your palms sweat it's like discovering what anxiety feels like for you like one of my clients it's a buzzing feeling in the back of his tongue you know that's not something I would have taught him right. but he discovered that on his own and that's so incredibly empowering mm -hmm. um you know because it, it gives him a clue as to when 
-hmm. he needs to do something for self-care. Yeah. Um, so yeah, interception is really shifting. And, and if this is the first time you're learning about it, you know, I, I just want to, you know, reassure people like you're not alone. Like this was me uh, 10 years ago, you know, like, yeah. So uh, yeah. And, and, and what we're learning about interception is just, um, I mean, it's, it's every single day we're learning new stuff That's about right. it. Yeah. 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 You and I have advanced graduate degrees and this was not part of our training. So yeah, no, no, don't be feeling bad if you're like, oh my God, even if you're a professionalist and you're like, I never heard of it. Yeah. Right there with you. Um, but that's why I'm so excited to talk about this. And I want to, I want to get into some tools and some strategies, but I want to touch on the social piece while mm -hmm. we're talking about the emotional piece. Cause I think this is another area where we just don't even realize how much our inner experience and our connection to our inner sensations and our body signals impacts our ability to communicate socially, to relate with others. So can you touch on that? Yeah, there's some really interesting research and I promise not to get too technical, <laughs> but um, what this research is showing is that in order to intuitively understand how someone else is feeling in the moment, we recreate our own interceptive experiences. So we call upon our own interception, how we would feel in that moment in order to intuitively understand how someone else is feeling. And so it's really like, um, kind of funny because this is what I like I, I have you know my I'm primarily a school-based practitioner and what I see in the schools is like we're teaching emotions with flashcards and it's like mm -hmm. here's a picture of a person smiling this is happy and what this research is saying is that understanding how and reading other emotions is a, a skill that comes from within it's a skill mm -hmm. from coming from understanding ourselves first and then we are equipped to understand other people but we are just like so focused a lot of times especially when we're supporting neurodivergence that we're so focused on social skills mm -hmm. which i think we should stop doing yeah. personally but like we're, we're so right there yes <laughs> like we should need a social connection that's what we yes. need to focus on yeah. meaningful social connection yeah. but um we're so focused on teaching them to think about other people and there's not enough emphasis on helping them understand themselves mm -hmm. like we need to rewind again rewind and help each person understand themselves. Mm -hmm. And then that is what neurologically and developmentally equips them to be able to think about other people. Yeah. If you're so busy trying to figure out yourself and like what's going on, you don't have the resources to think about other people. And it's not a lack of caring. It's not a lack of love and empathy. It's a, I'm trying to figure myself out here, right? And so if we can nurture that self-understanding, it goes a long way in that whole social connection piece. Yeah, I, it's it's so so critical, and even yeah, I mean, there's we could do a whole episode just on that because that's mm -hmm. but but I love what you said. We need to back up, as yes. with so many things with the population of of kids and individuals who are struggling with this stuff. We start, in my opinion, way too far up the developmental pyramid, and we leave these big gaps, and we don't recognize that. Wait a second, we need to go back, and we need to address some of these things developmentally that absolutely form the foundations for meaningful social engagement, not scripted social yes. interactions, meaningful, true development of relationships um, and engagement. So, so glad that you said that. I know, I think we've got people hooked. They're like, oh, this makes sense. I think people are having so many ahas. Let's get into some tools because I know parents are thinking, okay, so what do we do about this? How do we support the growth of this interoceptive sense? How, how, how do we nurture this um, for, for really any kid, but especially those who are struggling? What are some ideas you have about that? Yeah. So I want to tell you about the evidence really quick, and yeah, then we'll give good. you some like practical strategies. Awesome. So the evidence clearly shows that you can improve interceptive awareness, which is super exciting. Yes. Um, and the evidence-based intervention right now that is shown to improve interceptive awareness is mindfulness, but don't get scared. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> But it's specifically body mindfulness yeah. and being able to pay attention to how your body is feeling in the present moment. Um, so these studies are using different forms of body mindfulness to enhance the interceptive awareness in the participants in the studies. Um, so as an occupational therapist, you know, I know this evidence, but I have a lot of clients that bought traditional forms of body mindfulness is not a match. Like yeah. if you're out there listening and you've try, tried body mindfulness, we hear this from so many people, like, 
it is not easy. Body mindfulness is hard. Like it requires attention. It requires cognition, language. Like um, it requires, it assumes that you have a safe relationship with your body, which a lot of my clients don't have, whether it's because of a you know, history of trauma or they're chronically dysregulated and their body feels scary. Mm -hmm. So what we've done, um, you know, occupational therapists were really trained at adapting things mm -hmm. to make them more accessible and successful. So we adapted body mindfulness and we are using it very successfully for a wide variety of learners, whether they have a diagnosis or they don't, we're, we're actually using it as a preventative model for mm -hmm. all kids and adults. Right. Um, and so, um, so that all being said, now that you know what the research is saying, some of the things you can do, um, I think one of the easiest things you can do as a parent is just to start doing what we call interception talk um, or body talk and just start talking out loud about how your own body is feeling in the moment. So maybe you're holding like a cold glass of water and you say, oh my goodness, my hands feel cold when I'm holding this glass of water. Or you're getting a hug from your child and you say, oh my goodness, my you know, my um, heart feels slow when you give me a hug. So just starting to talk out loud about how your body is feeling and being that really good model for your child. And then you can start to shift your body talk, your interception talk to your child and start just inspiring their curiosity about their own body. Like, how do your hands feel when you hold this glass of water? And remember, their experience might be different than yours. Your hands might be might feel cold, but they might say their hands feel wet because there's condensation, right? So we always validate and honor every single person's experience. Um, and if your child doesn't have the language to be able to label what it is or they're noticing, that's okay. Um, still continue to do that body talk. Um, you could, if you have a cold glass of water, you could have them put their hands on it and say, oh, do your hands feel cold? And just, you know, just talking the body talk out loud uh, as often as you can during your daily routines. You don't have to do anything extra. It's just a shift in seeing moments as interception moments. Um, and I think that is really um, the biggest thing you can do as a parent. And I don't know about you, but like I was not, I was raised, you know, I think our generation was raised in, uh, and we're in a society right now where we, we ignore mm -hmm. how, like our bodies, yes. right? We yeah. push through, we stay busy, we, we're on our screens, we don't, we don't take the time. So this is a huge shift, even for myself with my own kids and just really talking about how my body's feeling and getting them to think about how their bodies are feeling can mm -hmm. go a really long way. Yeah, I think it's so true. And, you know, I'm thinking about those kids with, um, you know, who don't yet have verbal communication or struggle, you know, maybe with some of those pieces, I find that being attuned and observing what they're doing and then using some labels with that, like, right, like you can see, like if they touch something super cold and they pull back from it, you say, ooh, you know, maybe that felt cold or, oh, that felt uncomfortable or just having even that emotion sharing moment around that experience, like honing in on that, helping bring their attention to that sensory experience that they just had, you know, with that, I think can be valuable too. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's just another way of honoring someone's experience. You know, maybe they're jumping and you start jumping with them. And I say, I see your feet are jumping, you know, just being really attuned and honoring and validating their experience. Um, I don't think that's done enough. And, and I think for a lot of these kids are sub, sub, subjected to quite the opposite in compliance driven models yeah. where, um, you know, these compliance driven models are trying to make these kids fit into the way they think you know, what typical is. So stop jumping, sit still. You'll get your reward if you sit still. Instead of honoring and validating what that child's body needs and is telling them, these compliance-driven models are actually shutting interceptive awareness down and teaching that child and adult over and over again, ignore what your body is telling you you need and listen to my demand. And if you listen to my demand, I will give you a reward. Like that is very damaging for a lot of reasons, but interceptively it is very damaging. <laughs> 
Well, and I think that's one of the big things that more and more is, you know, the argument against interventions like applied behavior analysis and those kinds of things. And, you know, we've done some episodes on that. Uh, you can go back and listen um, to those for more insight on that. But this ties in really well, because the whole premise of those is ignore what's going on with you. What's going on with you is not important. What's important is what's going on with me and the demand I've given you in complying. And you're right, it does teach this total shutting down and ignoring um, and, and can really be traumatizing even from that standpoint. Um, and yes. that's what so many adults now with autism and related issues are saying. They're able to communicate about the trauma they've had at the hands of those kinds of interventions. But I think it ties in really well with what we're talking about here. You can't help a person develop better interoceptive sense, better honoring and understanding of their own body and what's going on within it if you're constantly rewarding, shutting that down and ignoring that. Exactly. That yeah. is exactly right. Yeah. So being a model, sort of, I, you know, this pausing, just taking time to be aware of our own interoceptive experiences, those of our kids, sort of labeling that, being in those moments together, that's a really important thing that we can do to support um, growth in this area. How about another tool or tip you have? Um, well, if you want to get a little bit more structured, um, one of the things that we're doing with the work, uh, we have the interception curriculum, and one of the things that we do in, in the curriculum, the way we adapt body mindfulness is we focus on one body part at a time. Um, so instead of like being able to pay attention to your entire body and notice how it's feeling, that is a really high level skill. Yeah, Not many, a lot. <laughs> yes. Not many of us can do that very well unless you have a very active mindfulness practice, right? And so we're chunking it down into one body part at a time. And so you could do this in many different ways. Like maybe as a parent, like each week, you're going to focus on one body part. And so you have to say week number one, it's hands. And you're just going to focus during your daily routines again on capturing moments where you're a child's hands might be might be feeling a certain way and again cueing them in and helping them to notice what that feeling is and if they're at a level where they can they can match their own interceptive language to what it is they're noticing um, and on my website we actually have a lot of free resources one is an interception daily activity list and it breaks it down into a lot of different um things that you're probably already doing with your child and like really good times to tune them into how their hands are feeling. And then we have a menu for feet and activities that could be a good time to tune them into how their feet are feeling. Um, Cause what we're finding is chunking it into one body part at a time and then nurturing interception during times when they're probably feeling a stronger sensation within that body part mm -hmm. helps trigger their attention to that body part. So if you go back to that example of holding a cold glass of water, that that's probably evoking a stronger feeling in your child's hand and it kind of helps to capture like oh my hands feel whatever it is cold wet freezing numb uh tingly you know whatever it is so we are always trying to catch those moments that are evoking a stronger feeling and then giving practice noticing and labeling that feeling. So chunking down into one body part at a time and then watching for moments that evoke a stronger sensation can be really helpful at um, developing and nurturing this uh, interceptive awareness in, in all people. We're doing the same thing with adults as well, um, but I know we're talking a lot to parents right now. Um, and so, and, and we're trying to get um, really good at how do we embed this into things you're already doing? Because, yes, right. you know, I have a daughter um, that had a long stretch of different therapies coming into our homes and they're all giving us different things to do. And I'm a therapist. I know I should be doing these things, but <laughs> my gosh, it is hard. But yeah. that the, the one therapist that um, she had such an impact on our life because she helped me to see how to embed things into things I was already doing with my family. And that is when the work got done. That is when the supports got used. So that is what we're trying really hard to do which I love um, about all of you who exist in the wonderful field of occupational therapy, because that's really your lens and your perspective, right? Is how do we improve function within the context of functional daily life stuff? And I, and I think you're right, especially for parents who are like, oh my gosh, this is one more thing, um, one more thing to work on. It's like, no, this is something that's happening all the time. So, so I love that you're giving people tools and resources to embed it into, you know, into those experiences. And, and I think it's really, um, you know, it's about slowing down. 
isn't it? It's about slowing down and allowing for those connections to be made um, in kids. But you can't do that in a fast paced, quick, do this, do that, do that. They, They can't process those sensations and then they can't form those connections. So you know, there, there really is a case to be made here as for so many other things that we might work on with these kids that we need to slow things down. Yeah, I think, you know, that's good for probably us as parents too. And, yeah. you know, there's a lesson here for me um, too, but yeah, to just really slow down. And, you know, I think too, to consider um, all the work that we're doing um, is always in periods of calm and regulation yes. um, because nobody wants to tune in when your body feels overwhelmed. So I think that's something else that, you know, goes along with slowing down um, and really considering um, how, how regulated your child and how comfortable they're feeling. Um, and think about the environment too, because what, what some of the um, emerging research is showing is that if you are sensitive to the outer senses, so say you are really sensitive to sounds in your environment, we know that that can be a painful stimulus sounds in your environment, you know, it it causes a stress response. And so these, for these individuals, they are hypervigilant to their, Um, outer world out of protection of their nervous system, right? They're always waiting for that next insult to their neurology, that next, that next loud sound that creates that stress response. So their attention is pulled outward constantly monitoring the environment. So they have no attentional resources left to pay attention to their internal signals. So you really want to think about, um, you know, where you're, you're doing your interception work and making sure that it's a place where your child feels safe and they're feeling regulated. And we're always doing this in playful and engaging ways. It's never a demand that we're saying, you must notice how your hands are feeling. We're trying to do it in an invitation and making it really playful and and feel safe. Um, I I think that felt safety is really important for uh, consideration. So critical. I'm glad that you, you raised that. And do you find it's also the case that these are things that take some time, you know, these kinds of connections between the brain and the body don't happen instantly. So I imagine that you probably spend a lot of time helping parents and professionals understand that this is work that builds over time. You don't do one session on how your hands feel and then expect that, you know, the kid's going to have that. It's, it's over time, the, the connections get made and then the efficiency of those brain body connections kicks in. So it's something that we don't necessarily see instant um, payoff with, but don't stop. We need to continue uh, exposing and putting language to it and working on it to help those connections form. Is that is that your experience? Yes, it is definitely not a quick fix. And, right. you know, a couple of things come to mind. Like, first of all, interoception work for all of us is a lifelong journey. And so it's not like you're going to work, 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 and you get to this certain, like, I don't know, goal or like end point and you're, you've achieved it and it's like all done. Like it's something that we all need to work on on a daily basis of listening to our bodies, you know, tuning into what the messages our bodies are sending us. Um, And so it is a lifelong journey, but for these, um, for individuals that are, you know, really chronically out of touch with their interceptive signals and we're doing this work in a clinical type way, um, it does take some time. and, And I'm always asked like, what is the magic number? And it really like it's not even as we haven't found it associated with anything like it's not associated like faster changes with age like we have not found any relation there some of my older learners take a lot longer than my younger learners and vice versa. It's not, um, it's not um, related to Um, a communication style. Like I've had some clients that don't speak to communicate that have made rapid progress. Like Mm -hmm. it's not associated with IQ. Like, so it it really is all over the board and we we can't figure out what that, what, what, what the mix is that, that helps someone make connections faster than others. Um, In some of the, the research studies that we're doing, we are seeing gains in our participants in as little as seven weeks, Mm -hmm. but, but don't like say I've been doing this for seven weeks and I haven't seen anything because again, that is so variable. And at the seven weeks in our studies, it's not like that person achieved like whatever that gold standard is. It's still a lifelong process. Like I said, you know, in the beginning. Yeah. I think that's so important. And there's so many factors that 
um, play into that. Like I, my mind, even the, the the nutritionist in me, my mind goes to nutrient status and the role that like a nutrient like zinc plays in registering, uh, allowing some of those signals. And so a kid or, or an adult who is deficient in zinc, that may be an issue. Like there's so many factors and throughout our life, those factors change, right? Depending on where our level of stress is or, you know, what's going on, we may have you know more efficiency or less efficiency with this so i think just recognizing all the variables is important but yes. the key is to recognize that it's something to address and something to be thinking about and something to be embedding in in what we're doing um with people absolutely. i think just the awareness there's there's so much benefit to that absolutely yeah. and, and it just helps us to get one step closer at understanding yeah. um and understanding some of these kids that can be hard to understand, you know, and, and, and that is really what drives us is just helping these kids to be better understood and better supported in kinder ways. Oh, I love it. You mentioned some great resources that you have. I want to make sure that people know where they can find out more about you, about your work, about your books, where are the best places online for them to go? Um, so there's two good places. Uh, the first is my website, and that's uh, Kelly dash um, and on my website we have a lot of free resources um, there's a whole tab that's called resources and we have free videos and blog and printables and you name it it's there um, and then we also have a Facebook group it's if you search on Facebook interception the eighth sensory system um, you'll find us there and I think we have like 17,000 people from all over the world and it is an incredibly supportive group. So if you are wanting more ideas, um, you can post there, or you can just follow along. And we have parents and caregivers. Uh, we have professionals and we even have lots of self helpers in that group. So it's it's an awesome place for resources. And we're always posting updates there as well. Like, you know, when we have new research coming out, or we see other cool research or resources or free tips there, we post them there. Wonderful. And um, your books and things are available on your website and other places as well where books are sold online because I think people might be interested in checking out your curriculum and things like that. Yeah, they're all available um, on my website. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Kelly's last name is Mahler, M-A-H-L-E-R. We will, of course, as always, put all of the links and things in the show notes so that you can easily click it. But for those of you listening who want to hop over um, to her site right now, that's the spelling of her last name. Kelly, this was wonderful. So much valuable information, insight, great tips. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us today. Thank you. It was a real honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And thanks as always to all of you for listening. We'll catch you back here next week for our next episode of the Better Behavior Show.